Throughout most of geologic time, there were only two primordial continents, Laurasia in the north and Gondwanaland in the south, separated by the Sea of Tetes. Gondwanaland consisted of Africa, India, Australia, South America and Antarctica. About 265 million years ago, this continental togetherness began to split. For 200 million years, the Indian subcontinent advanced at a record speed of 15 millimeters per year before crashing into Eurasia. The collision forced the crust to buckle, creating the enormous crumple zone, the Himalaya. Stretching 2,900 kilometers along the border between India and Tibet, the lofty Himalayas are the most dramatic and visible creation of plate tectonic forces. In just 50 million years, peaks such as Mount Everest have risen to heights of more than 9 kilometers. The collision is not yet over. The continuing movement of the Indian plate is putting tremendous pressure on the Asian continent. Serious consequences of these processes are the deadly earthquakes and tsunamis. The Gondwanaland expedition would drive from the Indian Himalaya to Cape Agalhas, the southernmost tip of Africa across 17 countries of West Asia and Africa, traversing areas of importance in the evolution of the Earth. It would give the expedition scientists an opportunity to conduct exploratory research and further their understanding of the earthquake geology and evolutionary history. The multidisciplinary expedition team comprised of two geologists, a botanist, a zoologist, an anthropologist, a medical doctor, a vehicle engineer and a two-man film crew. The expedition was led by Akhil Bakshi. This was Akhil's fourth major international motoring expedition. His first expedition, the 12,000 km Central Asia Expedition, renewed India's ancient links with the people of Central Asia, Chinese Turkestan and Tibet. The 10,000 km Azad Hind Expedition, which drove from Singapore to Delhi, refresh the national memory with the sacrifices made by the soldiers of the Indian National Army in their struggle to liberate India from colonial rule. Hands Across the Borders was a mass contact program to promote peace and development in South Asia. It drove 18,000 kilometers through the interiors of Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal and 16 states of India. The Gondwanaland expedition began its journey from the Jhaku temple near Shimla. From Delhi, the team flew to Bandar Abbas, strategically located on the Strait of Hormoz, Iran's jugular vein. Here, the 19th century Hindu temple built to serve the Indian community working for the East India Company was being renovated. All of Iran seemed to be out on the road with their pots and pans, picnicking, camping on the streets, celebrating the pre-Islamic Zoroastrian Noroz festival as they had been doing for 3,000 years. After the Rouhanis recited verses from the Quran blessing our journey, the Indian Consul General flagged us off from the Blue Mosque. We headed north to Shiraz, 
through the Zagros Mountains folded and faltered beyond repair. The Iranian plate is still pushing into the Asian plate, raising the height of the Zagros Mountains and making the country terribly prone to earthquakes. While the expedition was driving to Shiraz, an earthquake of 5.8 magnitude hit Luristan province of Iran, killing 70 people and destroying eight villages. The famous Vakil Bazar of Shiraz is still full of bustle. Though the camels, caravansarais and abacus have all gone, the bazaar still has an old world charm. Its cavernous passageways are alive with the sounds, smell and sights of all corners of Persia. Five hundred years before the birth of Christ, Darius the Great created the desert dreamscape of Persepolis, the ritual capital and the spring residence of the Persian emperors. Emissaries from India were regular visitors to the court of Darius. Raised by Alexander of Macedonia before his Indian campaign, Persepolis still retains some of its original splendor. Close to Persepolis is Naqshe Rustam, where the unapproachable tomb of Darius lies carved high into a vertical rock face. As we advanced northwards, our Scorpios were winning a lot of devotees. Friendly Iranians engaged us in endless banter about Bollywood actors. The ancient city of Isfahan, it is said, is half the world. It has several architectural marvels. The architect of the Taj Mahal was also an Isfahani. Medan Imam, situated in the center of Isfahan, is the second largest city square in the world. The impressive scale and beauty of the spectacular turquoise domes, the sky-piercing minarets, the mosques, the palaces and bazaars dazzle the eye. Speeding across the countryside, through towns of Tehran and Tabriz, along the Elbors Mountains, we crossed into Turkey. Driving along Mount Ararat, supposedly the resting place of Noah's Ark, we entered the wondrous snowland of southeastern Anatolia, just north of the border with Iraq. Below us was a grand sweep of a stark white valley, its floor layered with black rocks, scree and crags. Eons ago, volcanoes erupted porous rock, filling this basin. Water and wind wore away much of the rock, leaving a moonscape. We were driving over the North Anatolian Fault that ruptures periodically, causing devastating earthquakes. Our stout-hearted Scorpios climbed higher and higher, along towering walls of ice, on roads wet with melting snow. For two days, we drove along the picturesque Lake Van, 3,750 square kilometers of extremely alkaline water, rimmed with a series of snow-clad volcanoes, now extinct. On the way to the Syrian border, from the Arbakir, we participated in the wild merriment of Kurdish weddings. Stunning ladies and fine-looking men mixed in a carefree way, holding hands or clasping shoulders, they formed a ring, singing and shouting and kicking and stomping their feet to the rhythm of the music blaring out of a car. The Great Rift Valley, a vast system of ruptures in the Earth's face, 
is separating East Africa from the rest of Africa. This rift system starts from northern Syria and extends all the way down to Mozambique. We followed this geological cleft from top to bottom. Cradled in a bowl of dry hills in northern Syria lies the city of Aleppo, the cultural capital of Islam, the oldest city in the world, continuously inhabited for the last 5,000 years. The dynamism and raw energy of Aleppo have captivated travelers for ages. The citadel is the formidable symbol of Aleppo, regarded by some as the most spectacular medieval fortress in the Middle East. It has been stormed successfully only once by the Uzbek Timur Lan. The Gondwana land expedition, besides being a scientific expedition, was also a friendship mission that sought to promote people-to-people -people contact between India and the countries being traversed. The expedition also carried with it a goodwill message from the Prime Minister of India to the heads of states of these countries. In Damascus, we were received by the Prime Minister of Syria. South of Damascus, close to the border of Jordan, is the ancient city of Bosra. Located at the crossroads of caravan routes, it became, under the Romans, the capital of the province of Arabia. From Amman, at 2,800 feet, we dropped over the hills and slanted down the walls of the Rift Valley, plummeting below sea level, our ears aching from the changing air pressure. Crossing the River Jordan, the expedition entered the venerable city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's pool is as powerful as ever and pilgrims from all over the world flock to it. Israel was observing the Passover holidays and all roads in Jerusalem led to the Western Wall where every stone plays a part in the 5,000 year drama of the city's history. The wall is all that remains of the Jewish temple, the earthly house of God, and Judaism's holiest site. Next to the wall is the gold capped dome of the rock, the third holiest shrine for Muslims after Mecca and Medina. It marks the site from where Prophet Muhammad made his night journey to heaven. We walked the Via Dolorosa, the way of the sorrows, the route along which Jesus dragged his cross to the church of the Holy Sepulchre, which encloses the site of Christ's burial and resurrection. From Jerusalem, the 850-kilometer drive to Cairo was completed in a day. We drove along the entire length of the Dead Sea, shrinking by a meter every year. At this rate, it will dry within three decades. As the sea's water disappears, 
it creates these large sinkholes. Traversing the Sinai Desert and going under the Suez Canal, we entered the Africa of our dreams. History offers sufficient evidence that relations between the people of the Indus and the Nile existed since the days of the pharaohs, 5,000 years ago. Indians and Egyptians traded and migrated freely between the two regions, over land and across the sea. There is no better way to trace the course of Egyptian history than to follow the course of the Nile. The river has been Egypt's lifeline for millenniums. Along its length, pharaohs, nobles and lesser mortals have all built monuments and tombs to immortalize themselves. Luxur, the ancient capital of Upper and Lower Egypt, is home to the 5,000-year-old Karnak Temple, the Goliath of Pharaonic architecture. The might and grandeur of the pharaohs still pars Egypt's $8 billion tourism industry. At Aswan in southern Egypt, we were told that there was no land route into Sudan. We would have to take the weekly ferry across Lake Nasser to reach Wadi Halfa on the Sudanese side. However, there was a seldom used border post at Arkin under the control of the Egyptian army and permission would have to be obtained from Cairo. Many strings had to be pulled and in the end, after a day's delay, we got permission. After paying our respects at the Temple of Ramses in Abu Simbel, the expedition pushed on towards the Sudanese border. The road ended at the barbed wire border. On the other side was a vast sea of sand the lifeless, treeless, Libyan desert. As we rolled into Sudan, an Egyptian army officer said, this is the first time any foreigner has been allowed to cross the border from here, and that too in their own vehicles. You have made history. We decided not to take the regular safe route along the Nile to Dongbulla, 450 kilometers away, because it was sandier. Instead, we took the alternative route, 50 kilometers inside the desert, but less sandy. The risk was that there was not a village or a soul on the way and we could not get food or help if we got into some trouble. Two kilometers into the desert, the vehicle sank thrice in the sand. Luckily, 